Welcome to our ongoing series of videos on axial members. In our preceding video, we talked about tension member modes of failure. That was from chapter five, section one. We called that uh, video A. We're now going to do video B, which is going to focus on tension member sizing examples. Uh, among our general comments that the previous video uh, identified the failure modes. So this is basically what I just said. Your learning objective from this particular video is to understand be able to perform simple sizing procedures for tension members made of common materials used in tensile applications and architecture. So, as we talked before, failure modes for tension members it can occur in the connections or the yielding of the material. We're not going to look at connections in any great deal detail for tension members. We've talked about what the issues are to avoid ten tensile connection failures, um, but the sizing of them tends to be rather complex. We mainly want to know that we can roughly size the cross sections of the tensile material in order to avoid yielding. We mentioned that the common materials are steel, rod, aluminum rod, stainless steel rod, and high strength steel cable. So just to refresh your memory, we've said the resistance factor for all of these members is going to be taken as 0 0.85. When we multiply that times the yield stress of the material, that gives us the design stress. And here are the pertinent yield stresses for the materials we want to look at. Steel rebar is a very common form of tensile steel. It's intended purely for its tensile capacity as re in reinforcing concrete. Uh, 6061 T6 aluminum bar or round rod or whatever can be used as a tensile member. Um, the yield stress is 35 kips per square inch. Among the common types of stainless steel and architectural applications are 302, 304, and 316. These designations just indicate different things about the amount of varying alloying materials. In general, uh, 316 is the most weatherable uh, and probably the most expensive, but 304 also works well for outdoor applications. There are some pretty famous buildings that have been made out of 302, like the Chrysler building, but it's generally not considered the highest grade at this point. Ironically, on a per square inch, these have the same yield stress as our structural aluminum, 6061 T6 aluminum, which is 35 kips per square inch for each of these grades of stainless steel. And finally, we have high strength steel cable, which is made out of multiple strands of high strength steel wire. Um, and the yield stress for that wire is 250 kips per square inch. It's an incredibly strong material. The problem is it's no stiffer than any other steel. Uh, and as a consequence, in order to fully realize all this yield, all of this stress capacity, it has to be stretched uh, a very substantial amount, which means it uh, is sort of like the rubber band of architecture. And you can't just use it without uh, certain clever techniques. It moves too much. If a structure moves too much, glass can break in the windows or people will perceive the movement and be disturbed by it. So we tend to use high strength steel cable in pre-stressing or post-tensioning situations. Um, but there are applications where it works really nicely. And uh, we talked in our previous video about the beautiful uh, cable trusses uh, in, in the RDU airport, for example, as an application. Okay, so let's talk about some sizing. Let's take this overhang as an example, and let's suppose someone has done a loads analysis, which could be wind load, or it might be a seismic load, because this is the uh, California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, where seismic effects are very significant. And for the moment, we don't have the computational technique to tell us to allow us to derive an answer like this, but let's say that uh, some structural analysis has been done and it's been ascertained that uh, it's, it's reasonable over the lifetime of the building to expect a tensile force in one of these rods of about 4.5 kips. 
So now we want to ask ourselves, how would we size that rod? Uh, this rod, by the way, uh, this entire structure up here is probably aluminum that's been anodized. It could be stainless steel. The rods could be aluminum or could be stainless steel. It turns out, of course, the sizing procedure will be the same because the yield stress for our structural aluminum and the stainless steel grades that we use are the, is the same. It's 35 kips per square inch. So for the moment, let's just assume that these rods are aluminum. So in 6061 T6 aluminum, the yield stress is 35 kips per square inch. The resistance factor is 0 0.85. So the design stress is phi times the yield stress which is 0 0.85 times 35 KSI, or 29.75 kips per square inch. So, and by the way, let's assume that the 4.5 kip tensile force that we're trying to account for in these rods is the full factored load. So in other words, we've applied load factors already, and we're basically designing for that. And under that full factored load, we want to be assured that our stress never exceeds this design stress. So the minimal required area will be the force divided by the design stress. This is our classic stress equals force over area or area equals force over design stress. Uh, and in this case, we're designing for a full factored load of 4.5 kips. We have a design stress of 29.75 kips per square inch. And when we divide that out, we discover that we need 0.1513 square inches of cross-section of 6061 T6 aluminum in order to assure that under this full factored load, the stress never exceeds 29.75 kips per square inch. So now let's assume that we're going to use a round rod as the tensile element. The cross-sectional area of that round rod will be pi times its diameter squared over 4. And so if we rearrange this, we know what our minimal required area is. We want to find out what the di diameter is. So we're going to say the minimal required diameter is going to, and we take the 4 up and the pi down below, and then take the square root. So it's 4 over pi times the minimal required area. And then we take the square root of that. So that's 4 over pi, which is 3.14159. The required area that we came up with was 0.1513 square inches. And when we process all these numbers and take the square root, we get 0.4389 inches as the diameter. Now, round rod in aluminum or steel or stainless steel will come typically rounded off to sixteenths of an inch. It comes in multiples or modular dimensions of sixteenths of an inch. And when we look the, at this, it rounds up to a half an inch. Uh, I've run a table here in, in Excel where I say the diameter in numbers of sixteenths. So this is one sixteenth, two sixteenths, three sixteenths, and so forth. And when I scan down, the closest number is 0.4375. This is the minimum. This is almost there, but you can't play the game of it's almost good enough. You want to pick something that's actually on the conservative side or better, which is why we've ended up with a diameter of 0.5 inches. So in other words, we came up with a half inch rod. And that's probably pretty close. I just made up the number. Um, relative to the so-called factored force um, because I mainly wanted us to go through this exercise. But those are very small diameter rods uh, up in that uh, big overhang. Now, if we go back and run some numbers here, I did a spreadsheet, by the way, where I put in the fee factor and the yield stress for various materials and calculate the design stress. And then here I have in blue an input number, and I put it in blue and bold, meaning I can change that number. And in the spreadsheet, when I adjust that number, uh, the required area is automatically calculated and the diameter is calculated. And here is the rounded up number for the diameter. What I'd like for you to focus on right now, though, is that the yield stress for the high strength steel cable 
is 250. The yield stress for the aluminum or the stainless steel bar is 35. So if I take a ratio of 250 over 35, I get 7.14. In other words, the yield stress of the high strength steel cable is 7.14 times greater than the yield stress for either the aluminum or the stainless steel bar. If I take the square root of that, I get 2.67. This suggests that the diameter of the aluminum rod or the stainless steel rod would be on the order of 2.67 times the diameter of a solid wire of high strength steel. Um, we can't get really large diameter wire though because if you do that it's not fully work hardened all the way through. So we have some limit to how large the wire can be, but also in architectural applications we almost never deal with single high strength wires. We buy this in cable, which typically will consist of at least seven strands of high strength wire twisted together in a close pack configuration. Now, close pack configurations still have some space between the wires. So cables will have some voids between the wire strands. So the cable will not be fully dense with material. In spite of the fact, that fact, the cable will always be less than half the diameter of the equivalent rod of aluminum or stainless steel. In other words, for this particular problem that we're doing this sizing operation, the high strength steel cable will be on the order of a quarter of an inch in diameter, which at, at the height at the top of that building is almost invisible. Um, and the high strength steel cable would be fine. Sometimes for reasons of stiffness, cost, weatherability, or whatever, the aluminum rod or the stainless steel rod will be preferred to the high strength steel cable. But for the purposes of this sizing exercise, either one of those would seem to work. Okay, we talked uh, in the previous um, video about the fact that this represents a spread footing. It's going to be filled with concrete from the base up to the top here. These are the anchor bolts to which the column is going to attach. And, and under gravity loads in this column, tension is going to be induced in, in these steel bars at the bottom. So again, rather than do that analysis, which we're, we're not really quite ready to do yet, we're going to just make up a number. We're going to say, assume that the load analysis has been done and that the tensile stress that's going to be induced in these rebars is 49.5 kips. So, um, excuse me, this says aluminum and it should say um, high strength steel, so ignore those numbers. Here we have the design stress for steel rebar, which would be phi times the yield stress, which is 0.85 times 60 kip per square inch grade of steel rebar, which comes out to be uh, 51.00 kips per square inch as the design stress capacity. Now the minimum required area is going to be the force, which we said is 49.5 kips, divided by the design stress, which we said is 51 kips per square inch. And when we divide this out, we need 0.9706 square inches of area in order to have enough strength in this rebar under the factored, the full factored load of 49.5 kips to keep our stress below the design stress of 51 kips per square inch. Again, we go through our calculation that the area of the circle is pi d squared over four. Therefore, the diameter is going to be four over pi times the area and all of that taken to the square root. And when we put in the area that we calculated before, multiply it by four, divide it by five, take the square root, we discover we need a diameter of at least 1.1117 inches. Now, steel rebar comes in eighth inch diameters. It starts with a number three bar, which is three eighths of an inch. Some time ago, they used to make a number two bar, which is two eighths of an inch or one quarter. A three eighths inch bar is a number three bar. So the number is always the number of eighths of an inch in the diameter. So you can have a 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight bar. So a seven bar is seven eighths of an inch in diameter. So when we go look at these dimensions, we discover that to round this number up to the next larger one is nine eighths or one and an eighth inch in diameter, but we call it nine eighths or a number nine bar. And again, I ran a spreadsheet for the rebar number, it's one. And I shouldn't even have that there because the smallest rebar you could possibly get is at number two. And actually number three is, is the, the smallest that's commonly available. But if we scan down here and we're looking for something that's greater than 1.117 inches, we see uh, that it can't be one but it is less than 1.125, which is 9 eighths, or in other words, a number nine bar. If we'd used 40 kips per square inch, we would have ended up with a larger bar. There are some 70 KSI or 80 KSI uh, steel rebar available, but they tend to be primarily used for certain specialized applications. So we're gonna stick with either 40 KSI or 60 KSI rebar for all of our calculations. So again, I did all this in a spreadsheet to check myself for 60 KSI rebar. We multiply 0.85 times 60, we get a design stress of 51. We input our axial force and calculate the required area. Then we get the required diameter and then we get the rounded up diameter which is in multiples of eighths of an inch of diameter. That concludes our video on tension member sizing examples.